Hello and welcome to another edition of Bulldogs Unleashed and a very special one we have this week for Women in League Ground and that's why one of our co-hosts is Lauren Milner who's the female football operations coordinator for the Bulldogs. Lauren, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. We've got a great show lined up. Lauren's going to take us through not only her history uh, but her role with the Bulldogs and also where we are with Women in League Ground these days and the NRLW is starting off with a bigger competition and it made a big splash on the weekend too. There's that And right after the conversation with Lauren, we'll be bringing in a very special group of three Hughes brothers. It's Glenn, Corey and Steve, Gary's sons, who of course have continued the Hughes dynasty at the Bulldogs, but each has a story of his own. They've all won premierships with the club and they have so much to tell. So we're looking forward to that a little later in the program. But right now, Lauren Milner's with us to talk about women in league round. Lauren, I... We'll get onto your job with this in a minute, but play your part. There's more to play for. That's the slogan this year for women in the league. What does it mean? I think it means like we've got a long history with women in league. It first started in 2007, but there's so much. There's so much more to do. More, mm-hmm. you know, we've got room to room to grow. Uh, I think now, especially with our female players, and as you said, the competitions just grown again this year. We've gone from six to ten NRLW teams. Uh, you know, like we've now got to encompass them. It's about our grassroots, our junior, junior leagues, our volunteers, but it's also about our, our female players. It has grown so quickly uh, and so efficiently as well, and that's a credit to all, uh, not only from the top down, um, but also from the clubs involved as well. But women in league round, firstly, uh, we'll get into all that other detail shortly. How has it evolved? Because you, you would have seen quite a change back in the old days it was mainly to give visibility to women who were normally behind the scenes and, and they are so important to, to the running of the game. But we now live in an age where, thankfully, the, there are so many women who are ho- much more visible and we'd like to see more. But it, it's, it's very different, isn't it? Yeah, I think, you know, going back, it was all about, as I said, the junior league volunteers, the people that ran the canteens, the mums that set up the field, mm-hmm. the admin staff in a football club because essentially, you know, most females were just the admin, no, I shouldn't say just, you know, <laughs> admin staff play a, a really important role, but they were admin staff. Mm. Whereas now, as you said, we've got the so many women in senior leadership roles in football clubs, uh, in the NRL, on the commission. And then, of course, we've got the the women playing sport, you know, and at an elite level, you know, Australian Gillaroos, our mm. NRLW. Commentators. Commentators. Hosts, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. Ownership. And, yes, uh, yes, Chair people, yes. all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and uh, I mean, and, and as I said, I mean, uh, there there needs to be probably more women in those higher echelon roles in terms of management, um, mm. the high up admin, so to speak. Yes, uh, but nevertheless, I suppose the um, the thing we need to keep doing is acknowledge the people who don't normally get the credit week in week out, the ones that were was originally designed for. I suppose we've got to make sure they're still uh, given the credit they deserve. Of course, yeah. I come from a junior league background, so I'm still very passionate about that. Even though I, you know, now work in in this sort of world, in club world, but um, I, I'm really passionate about the junior league people and giving back to the the people that don't give get seen. Yeah. Tell us about your own journey. How'd you start out with rugby league and why? Yeah, so I guess I'd just always grown up around rugby league. My my dad, my brother, just my family, they followed rugby league. Uh, and then once I had my own kids, they got they started playing. My son started playing and I just got involved with the local, our local junior club. And from there I volunteered and then moved in as secretary for the club, uh, into, into vice president. Uh, and then I got involved with my actual junior league so Mm. I was on the board for the junior league district uh, and I was actually the first chair for the North Sydney Bears the first ever junior league chairperson yeah Uh, so that was really exciting and then I uh, I started managing teams as well so I started development squads I was doing Harold Matts and then I moved into the women's space and that's when Barry uh, approached me and uh, asked me if I would be interested in coming to the Bulldogs and I saw a really a real good opportunity because it wasn't just managing teams; it was mm. working working here as the female football operations. Yep, and it's something I'm so passionate about. Well, you've had a huge depth of experience there. How did you find negotiating? All clubs, uh, sporting clubs, have politics. <laughs> um, in fact, sometimes the amateur clubs are worse than the professional clubs. It must be said. How did you yeah. find managing all that stuff, particularly in a male driven sort of you know uh, environment? To be honest, 
I never really had a problem with the politics. I think for me, I, I've always been so passionate about what's right. If it was in, mm. if it was for the junior league, you know, what's the best thing for our club? What's the best thing if it was for the district level? What's the best thing for the district? What's the best thing for our kids mm. playing sport? And, you know, I think if I just stayed true to myself with those things, then the politics are easy to manage. And this, that's the same with the women's. I'm I'm extremely yep. passionate and I always make sure I think I'm doing what's right for our players or for our club. Yeah. It, it, it must be interesting for you with all that experience to to see how the young women are getting into rugby league now. You, you're actually yeah. seeing it at grassroots level. You're seeing the shoots growing if you want to keep the metaphor going, but yeah. as well as working at a professional club, that must be really satisfying. Yeah, that's really exciting. You know, uh, kids essentially they play – girls can play with the boys until they're 12. Right. And then, you know, there was really nowhere for them to go. They were switching codes or – Playing, you know, playing a different sport, mm. playing union, going back to tag or touch. Now, you know, we have our 14s, 16s, 18s and opens women's teams and it, that's just growing and growing in New South Wales. So th- they've got a, a real pathway even in junior league uh, and then through to our elite levels with our Lisa Fiola. How are they working in with the touch and tag? Because I know they've traditionally been very strong for the women as far as when I was a kid and that's a long time ago, but – the uh, are they playing both, uh, Lauren, or are they sort of moving from one? How does that work? Yeah, no, a lot do play both. We've mm. got, a, especially in those younger ages, but a lot of our uh, even our elite girls that come into our Lisa Fiola, they they play touch or tag. Um, but in junior league as well, New South Wales Rugby League, they've got league tag now as well. So we've got girls only league tag teams, and it's just about transitioning those girls mm. across from that tag to tackle. But we do have a lot that do both but I guess as you get sort of more senior and further on in your journey you have to pick which you know you have to choose yeah and, and look it's no different to the boys uh in that you, you you'll get kids who will gravitate towards the more contact side of the game and you'll get others who will sort of oh, yeah I'll stick with the tag or the touch I suppose yeah uh, yeah and what about um particularly with the Bulldogs it's it's been a, an interesting journey I'm sure uh, when you came in here to work with this this kind of new department really yes and you've got a setup that hasn't really got an NRLW club yet but certainly working vigorously towards it tell us about how you've created well we talked about it with Baz Barry Ward previously this mm. getting the base of the pyramid right before yeah. you get to that pointy end which is the NRLW yeah so it's been incredible coming here uh, you spoke about Barry he's he's excellent and one yeah, thing. come on! I want you to <laughs> I want you to give me some dirt on him. No, <laughs> hey, honestly, he's so he's also really passionate about the females, and it's a genuine pathway. I've I don't think I've really ever experienced that before, where we're not just ticking a box or that you know we're mm. doing a women's team, but maybe not the whole program. Here we've got the Lisa Fiola, the Tasha Gale, and the Harvey Norman Women's Premiership, and as you mentioned, we're you know hopefully hot hot on the heels of NRL for the one of the next licenses, but. Uh, I've just I've loved it. We're we're trying to build, as you said, the best program on and off the field. We were mm. really competitive this season with both our Harvey Norman women's and our Tasha Gale in the grand final. Unfortunately, we both lost. Well, that Harvey Norman women's was remarkable. Yeah, one nil. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's not talk about that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we, you know, it's not just success mm. on the field for us. It's about our success off the field and and the support we give those players off the field as well. And I think that's something that the Bulldogs do extremely well. You've generated a number of players. Quite a lot of your uh, New South Wales Cup or Harvey Norman Women's Cup squad uh, went into NRLW. Yes. Uh, how, uh, I, I, I don't know. I might be asking you this question too early in the piece because we haven't got the licence yet. But when it comes to that point where you know you have the NRLW team, mm-hmm. uh, retention is going to be important, isn't it? And, and I suppose from the women's perspective, that is the players, yeah. um, they might be thinking, well, I'd love to play for the Bulldogs. So I'm, what, do they just sign a one-year deal or something? Is that how it works yeah. if they're going to play uh, at this level for another club? Yeah, so we've actually had girls do this. So right. uh, the, t- the next licences won't be until 2025. And think, uh, as I said, hopefully we're one of those. Mm. But, yeah, we've had girls – go to a club and be offered three-year deals and say, I only want to sign for two years because I want to be back at the Bulldogs in 2025. That's so nice. It is really nice. And, yeah. yeah, retention is extremely important to us. And we can't forget too that in those two years there'll be lots of other young women Correct. coming through as well. So yeah. there'll be, a, I presume, a, a really core 
uh, group of players who'll be on that timeline, I suppose, hoping to play together in the blue and white. Yeah, we, uh, as I said, Ali Fiola, that was only a short comp this year, mm-hmm. but that's our under-17s. Uh, next year, hopefully, it's going to a longer competition. And then our Tasha Gale, which is our 19s, they were extremely talented. We had seven girls from that Tasha Gale go into city country and four okay. of them go into the origin for under-19s. Wow. Uh, in the Lisa Fiola, we had six of those go into city country and there's no uh, origin as such for that. But in the city country, we had four uh, – sorry, six of those girls go in there. So, Gee. you know, we've got some really talented players in our in our pathways. And, and uh, retention is one thing, but I guess in the short term, it's an interesting calendar for the women, isn't it? Because they've got a fairly good, uh, in Queensland and New South Wales, state-based mm-hmm. competition, and then they move into the national competition. We've been sort of tinkering with that, haven't we, in the yeah. last few years to make sure they get it right. Do you think Do you think they've got it right now, given the number of teams at the top level? Look, it's really hard. It's, it's such a juggle and everyone's sort of not competing against each other, but everyone has different agendas, I guess. And mm. uh, at this year we did the earlier competition. Next year there's more discussion, you know, about what that competition is going to look like right. for the lower levels. And it, it's really hard because we've got origin that happens in June. Mm. So the girls need to be playing to be selected, to have match fitness, uh, to be ready for that. But it, they also don't start NRLW until July. So if they end in September, October – and then we have a competition that's aligned, they're not playing football again until July and, that, yeah. you know, that's not good for prof- professional sport either. No, it's not. What do they do? On that subject, were you happy with the first round of NRLW? You've got a really good splash in the media, televised, it looks great, and uh, it, the, it, it, was, it was just great entertainment. Yeah, I think, it was, I think it was excellent. I was lucky enough to get to one game and I watched all of them on TV. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that Channel 9 is broadcasting all of those games, you know, is is amazing. Mm. Um, but no, I think there was there's a lot of new players in NRL with the, the competition going from six to ten, but, I, you know, we didn't see any massive blowouts and I think that's credit to the talent that we have coming through. Yeah, I tell you what, it's it, 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 that is the, the single biggest thing with any sport and we talk about it with the men's sport too in rugby league is, is to make sure that players who are coming through getting that first opportunity at the top level are actually able to compete. And we, we have these arguments all the time, don't we? Some people say there's not yeah. enough talent in the NRL at the moment. Um, and that's a whole other issue. But to see young women coming through from the state level competitions and getting in NRLW and actually matching it is, is really important to see. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the Elite Pups Academy program. <laughs> Tell us about that. I love the name. Yes. It's a great name. <laughs> yeah, so this was something that we've been working on for a, a long time now. And basically it was to go out and find the most elite players around 17 years of age. But we had some 15-year-olds, we had some 19-year-olds, but on average uh, the girls were 17. We had 16 players come in. They were from all over. So we had from New Zealand, Auckland, Mm. uh, Wellington, Christchurch, and then we had from Queensland up in Brisbane, uh, rural New South Wales and Sydney, of course, as well. Uh, and the camp was excellent. So they came in for five nights that they stayed in a hotel and then we travelled them here to Belmore every single day. And it was a real holistic approach to rugby league. Of course, mm. we did a lot of field skills, you know, gym testing, the skill-based stuff, you know, of core rugby league player needs. But mm. we also did things like a cooking class. You know, we had our yep. dietitian come and do a talk on nutrition uh, the girls did a core and yoga class. Um, yep. Yeah, it, well-being, of course. Um, so I think it, it was a great it, – as much as you could fit into five days, <laughs> we did. And I think it's great for them to see how, how an elite player – you know, what an elite player needs to do and where they need to be to get to that elite level. That's a good point because, reg- again, regardless of the sport you're playing – it is a massive commitment, and yes. if you want to do it right, it, it does take, as you say, an all round a holistic approach. Um, the Vari Group, um, very important role that they play. We should give them a nod because it's not often you get a sponsor who says, "Look, I'm going to support female rugby league." Uh, absolutely, Vari Group have been amazing. They came on as our first female pathways sponsor, uh, and. They've been incredible. Not only their sponsorship, and of course, they, they were the ones that got the elite camp happening Mm. but off the field as well you know away from their sponsorship they're giving our girls jobs we've put 
put right. about six players through traffic management courses uh, okay. and then they've employed those players. Uh, they've given opportunities f- for another girl outside of their own company through their contacts mm. um, in a career that she wanted to move into. So they're, they're absolutely incredible and, you know, we're blessed to have them. It's a bit like going back to the old days of the men's sport, isn't it? Because there was a responsibility from the clubs to find them employment as well as get them playing the game because, you know, they're recruiting players from all over. We've talked about this with the guys who've played back in the 80s, etc. So yeah. it's it's a different phase of the game and, you know, hopefully one day it won't be required but it doesn't hurt to have some vocational training anyway. Yeah, no, and, you know, with Vari Group and with our own careers and education team here at the Bulldogs, I think we do that really well in mm. the female space. Uh, outside of that, we put multiple girls into school as teachers' aides because that works exceptionally well mm. with the hours that they're required for training. Uh, and, yeah, I think that's part of that off-field support I was talking about. We've got girls moving over from New Zealand, away from their families, living on their own. So we need to make sure that we support those players as best we can so that they can perform on the field. Finally, uh, something that came up uh, when I've discussed with other athletes, other clubs and other codes, and that is having a high-performance unit or at least a training academy where the men and the women can actually train together because they both represent a club and they they want to actually be together and feel like they're all part of the same organisation. So we're doing that with high-performance, which, again, is pretty rare. Yeah, so we've got the new high-performance centre that's going to be 50-50 split, female males, and that's really exciting you know i think for that nrlw bid that we we're going to be putting mm. forward very soon for 2025 they've that's one of the requirements but that's something we've already got in place mm. and a, as are a lot of other things we've got that high performance center training with the males um equal opportunity really and that comes back to the women in league round yep. you know that equal opportunity and, and interestingly enough, you know, you, you get motivated by the players around you. And I've spoken to some of the, the blokes who've been able to train with the, the women who played for their club. And the motivation goes both ways. You know, you're inspired by players. It doesn't matter what gender or sex uh, is involved. Um, uh, it, training is one big group. Um, it, it actually helps everybody from what I've heard. Yeah, 100%. You know, the girls, of course, there's pioneers in women rugby league who the girls look up to. But they still look up to their peers in the male space as mm. well. You know, they, especially position specific, you know, they they absolutely look at those players and, and what they're doing in their game and, you know, want to be around them, want to learn from them. You know, that one of the things about the female game is that often they didn't start playing at six years old. You know, they might have started yeah. playing when they were 14. So they may not mm. have that same footy knowledge that some of these boys do. So the girls are sponges for them to be able to, you know, hear from the boys and learn off them. It's really important. And long term, hopefully it'll work both ways. It's abs- absolutely. You know, we could name a few female athletes uh, in NRLW right now who would inspire <laughs> a lot of young players uh, uh, in the men. Of course, yeah. yeah. And I think that's what we see. We see so many of these, the boys now, you know, coming to watch our female games yep. and uh, aspiring to be like the women. So yep. th- Really exciting. Now, the future is very good and let's hope, uh, as we've discussed, the Bulldogs can be a major part of it. Lauren, thank you for your great work you've done for the club so far and uh, keep it up. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks so much, Bill. Lauren Milner there uh, in Women in League Round. This is Bulldogs Unleashed brought to you by Reclaim the Game. We'll be back with the Hughes brothers to tell a few yarns about one of the great sporting dynasties. Pangai Jr, Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs. I grew up around here. I just love being with a team. I come from a big family, so having a lot of teammates is um, a lot of fun. The fans are important to me because when we need some momentum and they cheer us on, it gives us a lift and gives us extra momentum. So don't let a bet take you away from the match means to me. Is, uh, you're gonna miss out on Josh had a card down the line, a chip and chase from Matt Burden, and uh, that's things that you don't want to miss. Betting has affected me negatively, uh, both financially and emotionally. What I would say to a fan before they think about betting is Don't chase your losses and pay all your bills, pay your rent, pay your mortgage and pay everything before you do gamble. Don't let a bet take you away from the match. So reclaim the game and be gamble aware. Let's talk about the dog days. We're back on Bulldogs Unleashed to look at the dog days with the Hughes dynasty. Yes, all three are here in the studio with me. We've got Glenn, Steve, and on my left, Corey. Thanks for joining us, boys. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. And we really appreciate you doing this because you all got different schedules and family commitments and everything. I know you two have just come back from Europe, so uh, we really appreciate you doing this not long after that. Have you cooled off yet? 
It's uh, no, we, 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 we left on a 42 degree day and come back to a 10 degree day, but it's hard, <laughs> hard to adjust. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what's hard to adjust is uh, is playing footy when your dad and uncles are already legends of the game, let alone the Bulldogs themselves. So I want to start with that. Um, I suppose, uh, well, Glenn, you're just the oldest, aren't you? We're a year ahead of Steve. Yeah, so there's 14 months different, yep. the difference between Stephen and myself. And then a, a bit of a gap to this bloke over here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so how was that, the dynamic, uh, when, when, when you kids were playing in the backyard? I suppose you knew who your dad and your uncles were. Of course, uh, Gary's sons were talking here in case anyone's not caught on. But uh, what was it like? Uh, yeah, it was fun growing up. Dad was always involved in any of our sports growing up, whether it be uh, rugby league or cricket, um, school sport, anything that we were involved in, swimming. Um, it was fun. Plenty of backyard games in the at Streatham, Streatham Avenue, where we all grew up, but um, it was a fun time. Did you watch the senior he uses, Steve? Uh, on TV in those days, it wasn't probably as, as extensive as it is now, but you would have gone to the games, wouldn't you, and been yeah, involved that way? we were at the games. Glenn and I were fortunate enough to be ball boys for a few years too, so when they were playing, so we were always in and around the sheds with the players and stuff. Um, it was great and you know, Dad had miles of videos at home that we would just play back all the time, <laughs> basically. Uh, we'd watch them all the time, yeah. So. Did you always have that feeling that I'm going to be in this dressing room actually running out to play one day? Did that Was that just sort of ingrained in you or was it something that came later? Uh, I think it's something that we knew we had to work at. We, was always, we were always hopeful that we would one day get to the level that we got to but um, and we were lucky enough to get there but it was always something that we, we hoped to get to. Corey, did you sort of develop your association with the game by being belted by these two in the backyard on a regular basis? Pretty much. I didn't have any other choices, Bill. Um, yeah, that was basically every every afternoon after school, you know, straight home to the backyard, to the footy. Um, these guys were obviously a few years ahead of me, so taught me a few things in the backyard and taught me a little bit about resilience and, um, yeah, aiming up for a little bloke, so it was always interesting. What was it like for you? When did you first think, I want to reach the top level of the game and play for the Bulldogs? Uh, to tell you the truth, I, I don't really know. Um, there was just a process, you know, I was just, I enjoyed the game. Um, so as a 15-year-old, I was playing with a good bunch of my friends, uh, just at the local junior team and then, you know, progressed through the, the Harold Matthews and the SG ball down here and then yeah, it was just a progression thing. But I, don't, I never really felt, you know, that it was always something that I – I was trying to do or anything like that, but yeah, it was just a natural progression. And you know, once I got there and got my first taste, I really enjoyed it. And and Dad was on the show not that long ago, and he was saying that he didn't push you guys. I mean, is that true? Um, was it just as you said? Does it just happen naturally? Well, there wasn't much to do back then, Bill. It was either <laughs> footy in the in the winter or summer in the yeah. ah sorry cricket in the summer, and that was about it. You know, so obviously, like I just said, these blokes were already playing and. Yeah, we just signed up every year and it was on. Same for you guys. You didn't like I suppose uh dad was always there if you had if you wanted advice and those sorts yeah, of things. Yeah, we were all involved in a pretty good um junior rugby league side called St. Christopher's, who Brent Sean played with as well. So there's right. a number of guys that we all knew and families that we we're all close to. So we had a pretty good culture and environment around that around that uh around that footy club. So did that also help with the pressure perhaps, or maybe there wasn't, of being a Hughes. I mean, there was such an awareness. I know as a fan growing up, I watched your dad and your uncles play and they were idols of mine, you know, like a lot of other blokes of that vintage. Um, did you feel any of that pressure or was it because you had such a good club to play with and good players around you that it wasn't as bad? I don't know. I, I Myself and I'm sure the boys as well, I didn't. we didn't really feel that pressure. We never copped any pressure off anybody, no friends, no coaches, mm. never from our dad either, so... We, as we said, it just progressed into where we ended up being. Sounded like you had a good platform to work on. It's not always the case, is it? I mean, you've, you've all, I'm sure, seen parents have different attitudes towards their kids Definitely. playing sport. Yeah, they were always both supportive. Uh, mum and dad, mum was no slouch on the netball field either, so um, that probably stood us in good stead also. Who were your early mentors? I'm talking coaches here now. Um, were there any names that stood out, players, apart from, of course, within the family? Uh, just a couple of uh, junior league coaches that we had. Macca was one of one of my coaches that stood out. Um, uh, Shane Millard, who 
it was my Jersey flag coach growing up as well. Um, they stand out. As well as Opes and Steve Opes. Well, I, I was going to say, then you started to get in, of course, to the Bulldogs Club. I mean, um, how did that evolve? We might go one at a time here, start with Glenn, Steve and Corey and how it sort of evolved that uh, I presume it was Bullfrog at the time would have uh, would have got you on board. Yeah, I think Bullfrog saw me as uh, as in played the Jersey flag and then in 1991, uh, the 21s had a pretty good run through the year and we ended up making it and I got elevated to the under-21 side in 1991 and we ended up playing in the grand final that year and won President's Cup um, and then Bullfrog signed me so mm. that, on, a, on a small contract then and we are all still working back then, I wasn't full-time back then so it was a small small contract at that at that point and I was still working on the side outside of that, outside of football. Steve? Uh, I was pretty much the same, same mm. thing, pretty much come up from Jersey Flag. I think I played a few games in the 21s and then went to reserve grade. Our 21s coach at that time was Robbo, which was uh, yeah. very good. Yeah, <laughs> We're going to get him on too, by the way. He agreed just the other day to come on. The voice is getting better, so it would be great yeah, to have him on. Which would be awesome. Yeah. So that's a good memory for us. So. Absolutely. What about you, mate? You're a little bit, a few years behind these two. So how did it go for you? I was. Uh, same story. Mm. Uh, one of Dad's teammates coached me in the Jersey flag, Stan Cutler. Uh, coached me and Brent Shell and Shifty in the under-19s. And then, yeah, um, Terry Lamb was coaching the reserve grade back then and played a few games of reserve grade and then on to first grade with, um, obviously, Folksy. Jeff Robinson, Stan Cutler, there's some amazing names just coming out. And then, of course, you go under the umbrella of first grade coaches around that time in the early 90s, uh, Chris Anderson and then Steve Folks. Um, that must have been a very interesting part of the career too because, again, it's just all Bulldogs DNA, isn't it? Uh, it's just all around you is tradition, not just within the family, but – Throughout the club, yeah, it was. Um, these guys had Opes as a coach. Yeah, you'd become I never, a bit late for him. Yeah, wouldn't you? so yeah. I had uh, folks here who he built his coaching reputation on hard work and expectations. Um, there wasn't a massive, elaborate game plan back then. It was just, you know, pretty much the old run hard and tackle hard, mm. and we got to score more points in the opposition back then. So um, if we executed them things, we won most of the games. How, how was it under Ropes back in the early days? Because he was a very, went on to be a successful coach at other clubs as well, of course. Gave Melbourne their first premiership. Can we go with that one? Uh, yeah, Ropes was, was great being under him. So uh, we, we played in the 94 grand final under Ropes as well. So he was here for a while and Glenn was under him as well. Uh, and folks, it was a big part of that as mm. well. And you know, obviously Billy Johnson had a big input into that as well so pretty much the same as what Corey just said you know we were taught to be tough and train hard play hard you know so what was it like I'll, I'll deal with you two obviously because you would have come through around the same time uh, just a bit ahead of Corey so how often did you get to play together because you we'll get through that but you all had to deal with injuries at different times and in those days the Bulldogs always had a lot of players wanting to play for the club so it was very competitive wasn't it just to get to the first grade side yeah, well, that's, uh, Stephen played his first first grade in 1994 and he played a number of games in 94. I sort of played, a, played a, a, a couple of games in 94 and then progressed after 95, I guess. So Stephen and I would have played similar to what Corey and I would have played um, to, uh, together. Maybe Corey and I would have played a little bit more. But, um, uh, yeah, it was always fun playing with each other. And, and Corey, what t how many times did you actually get to play all three of you together? Uh, yeah, I mentioned that earlier, Billy. I think it was 13 games we ended up playing right. together. Right, yeah. Because there was a lot of stuff going on, you know, as I said, competitive for spots, but also injuries would have played a part as well. Yeah, I was sort of heavily injured throughout that period. Well, yeah. Bit, and missed and blokes not games. lobbing up the footy training. That's how I got my opportunity. Glenn, <laughs> Glenn didn't lob up the footy training, so that's when I got my nod. What was more important than training that day, Glenn? It might have been a big night out the night before. <laughs> <laughs> That was a competitive – well, let's deal with uh, Steve first because I I, um, I think I said at the top of the show that you'd all won a premiership with the Dogs. And I stand by that. Because, but, but you say, Steve, obviously, you, 95, you, you didn't get to play in the grand final side, but there was a good reason for that. That's right. So the start of 95, I paid 94 grand final. And um, the start of 95 in the seven aside, I did my knee and missed the whole season mm. and missed the grand final that year, obviously. So. So you didn't even get on the park that season? No. I thought you might have even got on. No, no I okay. I did it in the sevens at the start right. of the year and missed the whole season. 
Okay. So. Which is, well, uh, okay. I, I like to count it as a premiership for Steve, and I understand how you don't, but I, I'm being, you know. But tell us about 94, firstly. Um, that that was, of course, a great side that you lost to that year. It was, yeah. So that was, so uh, I probably played half the season sort of in first grade then, and um, that was my first sort of season, basically, and it was a great side to play in. Mm. Um, we probably peaked a couple of weeks early in the uh, major semi final when we went into extra time. Uh, it's a good memory for me, and then. I think we were just a little bit flat straight off the kickoff from uh, in the in the grand final. Yeah. Uh, well, let's let's move on to the later nineties now, Corey. Uh, you were with the side from ninety eight to two thousand and eight, so we'll, we'll move on to ninety eight for a sec because uh, we were talking about this at the Belmore game the other day because you and Glenn were heavily involved in that ninety eight side, and at times you played the same position, didn't you? Different times. Ah, uh, yeah. I. Was kind of playing half back back then, and Glenn was a bit of a utility. But mm. we there used to be a fair few interchanges, and so yeah, I'd play a bit of dummy half, a bit of five eight, and Glenn would do the same, and a little bit of hooker here and there. So yeah, we had a pretty decent rotation, um, and some blokes you know that could come on and play in the back row for fairly decent minutes too. How was it for you? You did move around a lot that year. Yeah, I played a lot that year off the off the interchange bench, mm. cover a few different positions. I could cover centre, five eight, anywhere in the back row, I guess. So, um, I worked well for the team. Uh, in the, it was throughout the semi final series, I played in. I uh, started in the the Newcastle semi final that we played, um, and then Polly come back the following week against Parramatta, and then he went back in. So. Yeah, there was a bit of interchange going on, but that's what worked, worked best for the team. Extraordinary uh, 98 season, of course, with the uh, the come-from-behind results in the semis. As you said, Craig Polamata heavily involved in some of those results. But like 94, you ran into an exceptional team. Um, in fact, when Corey and I were on stage with uh, with Dell, uh, Wendell Saylor, the other day, we reflected on the two lineups that year. And not that the Bulldogs lineup wasn't a great team, but... That, uh, that Brisbane team that year was amazing when you look back on it. Yeah, full of internationals. Wasn't yeah. It? I remember we were, we were ahead at half time and then they uh, essentially they just kicked in the fourth and fifth gear and just took off and ended up beating, beating, beating us by a considerable margin in the end. Yeah, I think the problem was leading at half time. No one knew what it was like to lead at half time after those yeah. semi final wins. It was a, it it was really weird. But um, uh, success did come to you, of course, in in two thousand and four because you stuck around a bit longer than these blokes. Obviously, uh, thankfully, you didn't get injured and you managed to get one, mate. Yeah, um, actually, I did have a couple of injuries that year, so I, I did. I played off the bench in the grand final. Um, I dislocated my shoulder early in the year. That's right. But yeah. it was a very enjoyable year. It was a totally different team to what we were just talking about in 1998. Um, plenty of youth and, um, you know, a new captain kind of ran out in the grand final. You know, Pricey obviously got hurt the week before. Um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was an enjoyable experience and, yeah, something I'll never forget. And, of course, uh, Sonny Bill Williams and Jonathan Thurston went on to do some pretty good things, uh, those two young blokes at the time. Uh, Steve, I, I, t- let's get back to 95 for a sec too. What is it like uh, to have to sit through a season like that where we had – had you did you have to write off the season from the get-go or did you hope that there was a chance with rehab that you'd get back on at some stage? What was it like? Uh, it was pretty much a write-off it from the get-go, so the – Crucial back then, you know, the operation and the recovery was a full season, basically. So, Tell um, us how that is, because we talk about it, you read about it in the papers when a bloke goes down with an ACL or a, pl- or a woman, in <laughs> fact, uh, goes down with an ACL, and we say, oh, that's terrible and it's horrible, and, and then they're not talked about uh, for a long time. Um, what is it like for the player? How, what do you do? I mean, you've got all your rehab and stuff, but what involvement do you have with the team and the club? You're still involved enormously, basically, but it is frustrating because you're just training all the time, basically. Yeah. And, you know, everyone trains to play, so not being able to get on the field was very frustrating. Um, I was blessed, basically, as well. So Billy Johnson pretty much took me under the, his wing a fair bit. That would be a tough wing, yeah. Because I was <laughs> injured a fair bit, so we used to do a lot of alternate training and boxing and stuff like that, right. which I enjoyed. So he always kept it interesting for us and very hard. So. And you played on to 2001. So what, what was it like for you coming back? Um, and how hard is it to come back from an ACL and, and just basically just doing rehab all those months? It was, it was difficult back then because so, I had a different sort of ACL operation basically, which sort of you know, probably lost a little bit of speed from the operation, which right. as a centre sort of affected my game a little mm. bit. 
So I probably had to rebuild a little bit the way I played um, so and get back to where I wanted to be. What was your best year, do you think, given all that? The one you sort of remember most and feel best about. Was it 94 um, or was it other, other another year? 94 and um, when we got knocked out uh, by Melbourne. In the <laughs> 99. Major, major 70, 99. I feel that was probably my best year. That's um, interesting. I was at my peak, you know, that game, if it had gone just, you know, in the last minute in another way. Um, yeah, so that was probably the best. Well, I've said it before on this show, but I interviewed Folksy um, oh, some years ago now and we talked about 99 and he always said, even though we didn't even make the grand final, he felt that like was the year that we re- he really that got away from us, uh, unfortunately. I know a lot of clubs have said that about a lot of years, uh, but um, that was one he thought that if we'd gone through that game, he, he had no fear of St George in the grand final. So yeah, I'd probably agree with that. that. Well. We'd sort of dominated yeah. St George that year. Yeah. Um, 2002 was a pretty pretty good year for us. We just got kicked out of the comp that year. <laughs> well, I was going to get to that. I was going to get to that. Bef- well, let's do that because I was going to talk about a few other things as well. Uh, but, yeah, that – what was that like? I don't know. It, it, oh, it was great. weird. We won 17 straight that year. So it was, yeah, we had a, we had a great year, super year. That 17 straight was enormous. Has them kicking it from the sideline against Newcastle. And, you know, playing that last game against Brisbane, we were already kicked out of the comp two weeks two weeks previous. Mm. But we thought that Brisbane were going to go on and win the comp that year because uh, they, were, they were one of the favourites. But um, and to beat them at home at, uh, at, uh, at the showground was pretty pretty big for us. Uh, I remember talking to the players in, the, in that time and um, – yeah, it was almost like a grand final, wasn't it? Was, it? Because yeah. it was kind of a statement game. And um, it, it is very hard for the players um, because everyone talks about the level of culpability when it comes to these things. But as a player, it's often very hard to go through that stuff because um, yeah. contrary to what a lot of people think, you are not aware of what's going on. Now that's totally true. I know a lot of the guys, you know, it's in the media and that what people are earning these days. But back then, you know, blokes were playing for – a lot more of the enjoyment of the game. Um, I think a little bit of that's left the game myself. That's my opinion. Um, so yeah, it was it was a bit of pill to swallow back then. You know, being being thrown out and told, you know, that you weren't going to be playing in the the semi finals at the end of the year. Um, and it was all probably none of the fault of the players. It's a heck of a run though, while it lasted, wasn't it? It was some amazing. That was the year has made the kick in Newcastle, wasn't it? The conversion yeah, from the well, sideline. Kicked it from the sideline. Yeah, yeah, it was during that streak. One Kept of the most the famous conversions in the history of the club. What was the role of Dad during all these years? Um, I spoke to him about it. Uh, he said he was basically there for you, but he was never sort of in your face or in your ear. It's probably more appropriate, but I don't know. How was it for you guys? Well, just bits and pieces of advice. Really, he was always supportive. Both both mum and dad were always supportive of, of any sport that we played growing up. But um, yeah, just little bits and pieces through the week. You know, I was never, you know, for one with, with his advice, but just little bits and pieces that he could contribute. Because it's a hard relationship, isn't it? There's a lot of sensitivity in footy clubs about coaching staff and and who gets to do what. You've got head coaches and, and their support staff have to work in pretty tight um, and there can't be any conflict there. And so when you've got a whole lot of other voices around the club, it's all got to be very diplomatic, hasn't it? It does, definitely. What about your uncles? Uh, did they have did they have much to say over the years, or was it kind of did they have their own way of channeling their communication? Did did Mark and Graham say something to Gary, and he? <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> no, not really. I think they were all very similar to Dad. You know, pretty quiet. If something was that they thought, you know, that they could pass on, they would. Uh, obviously, Yaz was here doing recruitment, so he was oh. always around the joint. Um, so he. You know, probably had a little bit more to do with us than Heaps did. Um, Yaz was pretty knowledgeable about the game, I think. And, yeah, you know, as a kind of middle player, he always had a few little tips around the ruck for me. Well, yeah, he, he, um, he as we said, we, we, we can't forget that both uh, Gary and Mark had roles in the club uh, in different in different ways. Did that make things any harder or easier at the time? Um I presume Gary was uh, – what was his role was when you were playing? Manager, yeah. yeah. So um, Bullfrog was here and yep. he was under Bullfrog basically mm. at the start and then Bob Hagen come in. Yep. Uh, and he p- played the same role basically. Um, no, it, it, we never felt like that basically. Um, all the guys were great to us. All the players we played with, there was never any of that. Mm. 
basically then and um, you know, heaps his role back then. He used to sit in on our contract negotiations. Oh, did he? So he would sit in and do that for us as well. Okay, because um, he, he's predominantly his role was in the media mostly ha- right. has been over yeah. the years. So took a slightly different path. But that's I didn't realise he was sort of acting as sort of, I don't know, what do you call that? It's not management really, is it? <laughs> Advisory. Really. Advisor, yes. Advisor. No. Negotiator. Did you, did you guys all leave home around the same age and, you know, how did that go? Uh, what, what, what have I trodden on there? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> Stephen and I left at the same time. So, yeah, right. Um, we ended up... Um, left the baby at home. Moving into a townhouse just around the corner. So Corey was still at home back then, but Stephen and I moved in with another friend at the time who was who was also playing uh, lower grades at Canterbury at the time. So the three of us lived in a townhouse for a number of years. Right, I was going to say... I was going to joke and say you left home last week, didn't you? But no. <laughs> I don't know. I left nice and early. <laughs> <laughs> we all moved out quite young. So yeah. we were, I was about 22, yeah. Stephen was about 21 when we moved Yeah. And, and was that, I don't know, that was, in those days, that was a normal age to do it. You know, yeah. I left home at 17 yeah. uh, back in the 80s, early 80s. So, yeah, it was, a, it was a, probably a much more common thing then than it is now, isn't it? No one can afford to leave home these days. Yeah, it's pretty much. They don't want to leave home. Now, so. <laughs> what about your kids? I suppose you've got to think about that where they get to leave home. Um, I'm trying to shoot more of mine out. <laughs> I've managed to succeed, actually. We're empty nesting. What about um, – did you ever have any fallouts, uh, falling out between any of you for any reason, or was it just silly family stuff if it was? Uh, I, saw, <laughs> I saw a couple of these blokes over here have a, a little bit of a night out once. Um, Stephen was going through a little bit of a phase where he got the gold earring in and <laughs> was ah. pretty leery and stuff like that. And, gold chain and the gold and chain. And the gold chain and Glenn – wasn't really appreciative of it, and yeah, we just sorted it out. Give him a little bit of, <laughs> give him a little bit. Of, how you going? We we're, were on holidays at the time. Mum wasn't too happy. We <laughs> and, uh, all over our face. Uh, we we know you've only had, as you said, the thirteen games together as a trio. But you know you've had other different combinations um, as 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 two of you on the field. So how was that, and and did it help that backyard, you know, history and just that instinctive knowledge of where the others would be or, or was the game at that level structured so that it wasn't as easy to do, to play that way? I don't know. It probably wasn't as easy. Um, I, I was lucky because I'd, I'd played a lot of footy with Shifty in my junior days and obviously these guys were, you know, Glenn was a close position mm. to me, Stephen wasn't too far away. So y- you can use that a little bit but I think by the time we got to first grade, you know, the, the game had gone – a little bit structure and a little bit of, you know, do your best. So it was a little bit of both, I believe. And and um, what about the players who played around you? Who, who were the players that you really enjoyed playing with? Um, uh, obviously Barr was you know, mm. an idol of mine as a kid and then got to play with him. And when we come to grade, there's also, you know, Jason Edward and Darren Britt. Dean Pay basically, so some good memories from all those guys. As a as a centre, you would have you would have really enjoyed playing behind those forwards. Oh, definitely, <laughs> yeah. And they used to like. I remember a few of my first games in first grade. They would protect you, and if somebody got you, they would get them. So. That that was, um, uh, I think, through all your careers, you know, from the start of yours to the end of yours, Corey. I think it's fair to say. We had a formidable forward pack for almost that entire time, didn't we? The, the, the names may have changed, yep. but gee, the nature of the the, the, the team was similar. Was is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, we did not not big, but very tough. Yeah, so, yeah, we weren't, we weren't a sizable pack by no means, but um, plenty of aggression. They come from a lot, a lot of our trainers, Billy Johnson, folks. Mm, mm. He was when he was trainer at the time, but um, yeah, not big, but but super tough. But, but a good balance of talent too, in terms of you know. Uh, tough, aggressive, but also some ball playing forwards, some creative forwards. Uh, we had a really good mix. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, come down to recruitment back then. I think you know they there's a few local juniors here, and then they'd you know bring a few guys from the country back then. You know, Steve Reardon um, was one of those guys that you were talking about. He'd stand next to you, and you'd be you'd be pretty happy to defend right alongside him. Um, so yeah, I think they they always got the balance really really mm. good in the team. Um, that's why we're probably, you know, right at the top of the table for most of the years we're all playing here. I, I think what we had basically throughout all our careers was there was sort of 10 guys outside of first grade who could fill in and just yeah. fill those spots. The depth was awesome back then, I think. So, 
Well, I, I, yeah, especially when you look at it in, in comparison to what we've been through in the last few years, obviously, yep. and you know, there are a whole lot of reasons for that. But um, the, uh, the, there was a t- – well, I suppose the structure of the league and the number of teams was different too, Not, notwithstanding that year we, we had 20 teams, obviously, with the whole Super League thing. But, um, Glenn, what was your best memory? We, we asked Steve, obviously, but what, what was your best memory, the best year for you? Uh, the 95 grand final yeah. when we, we won the grand final and I was lucky enough to come on uh, with about 20 minutes to go was, was a standout. And the 98 series. Mm. So the 98 series when we beat Newcastle and then went into – into the Parramatta great game um, that you always see on television. So th- those two years were standouts for me. But the 2002 season where we got kicked out mm. of the comp was a standout as well, the 1999. So there's a number of number of seasons. We just weren't lucky enough to get over the line other than 95. Just getting back to 95, um, I married into a manly family and uh, I went to their place to watch it, not expecting to win. Well, I hope... Kind of thinking we could, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Manly had a – I think they only lost two games all year, although they, they had a terrific season, they had a very good side. But um, typical Bulldogs team in a grand final, you just don't write them off. How, how was that game for you? Um, Manly complained about forward passes and extra tackles and stuff like that, but what, what was that like? Well, in the, in, in the end we won 17-4, so the forward passes and the seventh tackle, which I scored off. <laughs> seventh tackle have always come up, but um, – but uh, yeah, we ended up winning seventeen four, and I think we were the dominant team on the team on the day. Yeah, it was, um, it was a game that started out well for Manly from memory. They they actually seemed to, they they seemed to be winning or at least competing well for yardage in the middle. That that early battle, you know, for for physical dominance in a grand final that you see, but um, that didn't last very long. What was it like for you out there? What did you think? What, how did you feel about the game? I was it was uh, the atmosphere was like. Out there, I, I only come on for the last twenty minutes of the game, but yeah, to walk on, walk on the field with uh, with the caliber of players that we had at the time was was enormous. I was 21, 22 at the time, mm. so it was a huge occasion, and and just took it all in. What was it like for you, mate? I suppose um, not easy in one way, in some ways, to watch it. Where were you when you when the game was on? I was out there watching, so yeah, so it wasn't easy to watch, but I was pretty happy they won. So happy for my brothers. So. Do you feel as a player that, um, like I said before? You're in the squad. Uh, you were there in '94 and um, in the grand final. So, do you, do you must feel as a player though that you contribute to that, uh, or or do you find I that a stretch? Think, yeah, no, nah, that's a stretch for me. So nah, fair I'm enough. Not on the I, field, it makes it difficult. So, but you know what I'm getting at, don't I know you? Exactly you, you what you're you're getting building at. a team. Like you're they, part of that. Yeah. They 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 give you that support throughout the year, and it was awesome. Mm-hmm. But you need to be on the field. It's a, it hard. it's a tough game, isn't it? it is really, definitely, it yeah. is a tough game. There's plenty of ups and downs. So. <clears throat> um, well, I don't have to ask you your biggest disappointment, I suppose. <laughs> um, what about you, Glenn? Uh, what, what was the hardest thing for you? Because, it, well, I guess two thousand and two, maybe. But what else? Yeah, I was still I was still part of the squad in two thousand and four. Right. Got injured. Okay. I, I got. I, yep. I broke my arm. I tore my hamstring. That's right. My calf, yeah. So I was still part of the squad back then. But I think I only played the one game in first grade that year. Played maybe three or four games in reserve grade that year, trying to get back up. But we had a super side back in two thousand and four, mm. and my body was telling me to to give it away at that level. So, um, but yeah, that was disappointing not to be part of that. But. I was also, you know, happy and glad for the guys to, to push on and go all the way. What about um, you? Uh, was it was it O two when they took it took it off you or not? Ah, uh, yeah, the biggest disappointment, yeah, for sure. Mm. Yeah, um, greatest opponents. Uh, we've talked about some formidable grand final teams: uh, Canberra, Brisbane, of course. But um, who did you enjoy playing against, Glenn, back in the day? Who were the know. Who were the people that challenged you? And I don't know if I enjoyed playing. <laughs> well, okay. Who were the biggest but, challenge? Yeah, Gordon Tallis, Laurie Daly, all the all the big names back yeah. then. Minicello back then, just good balance and good. Um, they, they could just run and just charge straight over the top of you. So they just they were hard hard to handle. Was uh, you, you hear those old stories from the eighties about some of the stuff that went on on field? Uh, was that sort of still around in the nineties, or had we kind of policed that out of the game? You know, the niggle, the stuff that blokes get away with, and. That that can be also a, a, a pretty tough part of the game as well. But was it was it a little bit cleaner then? No. <laughs> <laughs> Depends what still around. Point, we? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the Royce Ayloff stuff, but it was it was still around. You could still kind of dig your elbow into a melon and yeah. and get away with it and stuff like that. But yeah, it was nothing like 
headbutting each other in the scrum and well, yeah, stuff like too that. many cameras out there back then. Too, didn't well, that's the thing, you know, the, the 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 review the review system was a lot more was a lot more uh, detailed. Uh, I think as time goes on, and certainly now, uh, there's a lot of stuff that uh, that that everything gets picked up, um, even swearing at the refs and things yeah. like that. But um, so, how um, uh, how did you find? Um, playing in a club with the tradition that it has, um, uh, was it a burden or did it really support you? How, how was that? We'll, we'll whip around the table for that one. Uh, no, I don't think it was a burden at all. We were, we were proud and glad to play for such a such a iconic club, I guess. So, and and as as all three of us grew up grew up around here and around Belmore Sports Ground, we saw plenty of games on the field, and, and we we're lucky enough to go out there and play play plenty of games. So, um, yeah, we we're lucky to be part of it. Do you agree, because uh, we talk a lot this year about bringing some of the old players back to hang around and some of them, of course, active in coaching and things like that. Shifty's come in, done a couple of sessions as well. But do you agree that it's important to have the older players around? For you guys, it was built into the club, wasn't it, with the, some of the guys we've talked about as coaches and, and indeed, you know, your dad was still there as an administrator and also did a bit of coaching too, didn't he? Uh, did, was he heavily? Uh, he coached 21. 21. 21. Yeah, yeah, that's right. At a lower level. Himself and Billy Johnson. So, so how important is to have those people, not just for what they bring in terms of coaching ability and mentorship, but just for who they were? I mean, does that mean something? Definitely. It was great back then. We had a lot of players, like the ex-players around the club and yeah. stuff. Um, I think it would be good for the guys these days as well, you know, and pretty much just to take a bit of the pressure off them, basically. Mm. <laughs> a bit of advice. They know what to do training-wise and playing-wise. So, yeah. Yeah, so because there's far more, far more pressure on them these days and the media and everything around them. So. Yep. How did, uh, how did it end for you, mate? You, you've sort of touched on it, but... you bit like Steve, I suppose. You just the, the injury got too much in that last year. Yeah, I only played a handful of games that year, so yeah. the body was sort of telling me to, to shut it down. But in saying that, I ended up playing some country footy down the south coast a couple of years after that. But obviously not as fast and as tough as, as playing at the, in the, at the NRL. Um, yeah, it was disappointing, but, yeah, I'd had enough. I'd had enough of the training. I think I was 31 at the time, so um, I was ready to... Ready to hang them up, so that was enough for me. And you were you were quite comfortable and ready for life after footy. You had yeah. had other work to do and business to do. Yeah, not not initially. The first it took me about uh, twelve months to get um, um, to get my stuff together, but um, and ended up landing in a in a good account management role for a payments company back then, and then just pushed on from there. What uh, uh, town did you play for in, in in country? Group seven, Milton Oladala Bulldogs. Oh, you played for Milton Oladala. Both Stephen and yeah. I went down oh, there. Oh, did you? Uh, we played that year through an ex-Canterbury contact, Peter Leffley, who got yeah. us down there as well. So uh, we played with Brent Sherwin's older brother, Greg, as well. Oh, so, right. Yeah, so it was a great year. We won the comp that year down there as well. So yeah, it was I'm great not, to play not surprised with you two in the team. So. What about um, uh, what about you, mate? How was how hard was it? it was was it again an injury thing that you sort of thought? Yeah, mine. So I sort of back end of my career, I was working and playing football. Mm. So um, yeah, and it just become a bit too much, I suppose. I was ready to start a family as well and mm. uh, do all that type of stuff. So something had to give, and yeah, some bad knees <laughs> wouldn't allow it anymore. Yeah, so it pretty much comes down to the training. You just don't want to train anymore, and it's, it's too hard. Does it if you've got an injury? Because I've, you know, you and I'm sure you guys have talked to a lot of blokes who found it really hard to transition back into normal life. Um, does it help when you've got the injury? Does it help you kind of resolve that, well, I can't play, so I've got to do something else? Um, or, or, or does it make it harder? I don't know. Um, I think for me, because um, same as Corey, we did our carpentry apprenticeship and mm -hmm. had builder's licences and stuff, so w I transitioned back straight back into that, right? Um, which is something that I always loved anyway because when Glenn and I started anyway, full-time, there was no full-time. You, were, you were, yeah. had a job and you were playing and then it become full-time basically, so... Right. Uh, we had a good advantage doing that beforehand. So. What about you, Corey? Was it difficult or what? Uh, not really. I had my last year at Cronulla, obviously. Um, I want to talk about that. I think you're the only Hughes, the previous generation in this one, that actually played for another club. Is that right? That's right. Apart from the Bulldogs in Milton yeah. Aladell, but yep. um, another NRL club. What happened there? Uh so I played here in 2008 and I wasn't sure. Like As Glenn said, you know, your body starts to – let you down a little bit and I wasn't recovering, you know, well throughout the week. And, you know, when you're a bit younger, you can get to Tuesday and you say, I'm ready to go again, boy. Mm. But when you're in your late 20s, you get to Thursday and you're kind of thinking, am I sweet to go tomorrow? So 
that was my predicament. But um, I was luckily enough to get picked in the city team. I was playing here at Canterbury and I got picked in the city team. So I went away there. Um, Tim Sheens was our coach and I don't know, I just got a little bit of a, an enjoyment factor back. Um, so when I came back here, actually the, the incoming coach said that they'd made a little approach to another hooker. So right. I kind of made up my mind that I was going to go elsewhere and play. So um, they kind of... Yeah, made my decision for me, but it was one I was comfortable with and I, I'm still comfortable with it. And I I enjoyed my time at Cronulla and, yeah, I made plenty of friends out of that year. Did you guys often wonder what it would have been like playing for another club? Did it sort of... Not not really. We probably got offered throughout our careers different contracts mm. at different clubs, but we, oh, it was always in Canterbury, so it would have been hard for us. And, like, it was harder, so it was probably... When Corey had to make that decision, it was probably a little bit easier for him then. So yeah, yeah. Um, when when did um uh, w- what is the thing about your career that you look back on most fondly? Um, not every player says it's a premiership win or a particular <laughs> game. It's it's often a whole lot of other stuff. What what is it for you? Uh, probably to play here for so long. Um, yeah. Back then, it was a fantastic environment. Uh, the culture was. Probably one of the best going around. Um, there were some fantastic people here, which helped. So, yeah, playing, you know, 200 odd games here was probably a highlight for me. Steve? Yeah, pretty much the same as what Corey. We've made a lot of good friends from Canterbury and mm. kept those friends um, going forward and stuff. Um, I know for myself, a good mate of mine, Troy Stone, who I played with here, yeah. you know, I get, I, I've, all my kids have grown up down on his farm in Wagga. We go there okay. a fair bit. Yep. So, um, those type of relationships are the one I enjoy the most. Yeah, we've got to get some of these country blokes actually back to the city for a special show, I think. Uh, it's just hard to get them out of the country, and I don't <laughs> blame them coming from the country myself. Glenn? Um, uh, just the culture and the mateship that you develop over the years, and, and a lot of those guys you're still, still good friends with now. You know, we have our – we try and get together a couple of times a year. It's been hard with COVID the last couple of mm. years with the – ambassadors luncheons that we have here and the reunions and so forth but it's always nice to catch up with those guys when we when we're able to catch up at uh, those sort of events how important is that stuff i mean as i said you've moved on you've got lives families all those things but those things are still important it keeps you in touch keeps Mm. you in touch with what's going on with everybody everybody has you know um, social media and so forth so you know bits and pieces about about what's going on in people's lives but when you get together and you're with them for you have a couple of beers and you're with them for Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine hours, or whatever. But, uh, you always get you always get more out of them. So um, yeah, the runs get longer. Get, the scores, <laughs> the story, the stories get larger. Same stories, pretty much. They just get so bigger. St- <laughs> <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with the regurgit- and, and, and regurgitating those stories. What about um, and how how important are those functions? I talked about the, the involvement of ex players with the with the clubs and just being around the current players but what about those kinds of functions that the role of the ambassadors because we had yeah. Phil Young in here for, for a yeah. show as well and he's heavily involved in all that so uh, and I know Luke Goodwin gets involved in that sort of thing as well so yeah. it's important for the club as well as the players surely oh definitely yeah so Luke always reaches out to you know numerous players and stuff and functions are on which is good so it keeps mm. everybody in contact so yeah they do a good job job at that um I, I can't let you all go before uh, we finish without asking. Uh, uh, we've been through some tough years. Uh, are you reasonably happy with where we're heading? Let's not just <laughs> reflect on results. Or, or do you want to do you want to take the fifth on that answer, <laughs> as the Americans say? Uh, you want to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> I think we're in a rebuilding stage at the moment. We still need to. You know, so we've got to give them time and give the new coach some time, I think. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, we go going forward. It is refreshing to see some of the lower grades, though, showing some pretty good results and some good Definitely. young players coming through. Yeah, I'm looking forward to next year, Bill. My, my nephew just signed here, so we're, we're looking forward to next year to come back and support him. Well, actually, you've, you've just answered a question I was going to ask. How many more Hughes are coming through the ranks? There's one actually sitting outside as we speak. But um, are they going to be coming through into the Bulldogs ranks uh, soon? We've got a nephew. I Who think else? probably out of all of us, Glenn's boys that don't play anymore. I've, right. I've got a few, but they're just sort of happy with club level. Of course, he's got a couple of good kids. Um, yeah. They'll have to get them away from the shark system, <laughs> I would suggest <laughs> earlier. <laughs> but we, you might see our niece coming through in the uh, – 
in the girls' age group in, in coming years as well. So well, that's, that's, that's the new dimension, isn't it? It's it great. It gives all yeah. the kids an option uh, to come on and play. Uh, well, look, we, we really thank you guys for taking the time out. You're probably still jet-lagged, but um, we really appreciate it. And uh, we will get you back to talk about other things on other days. But for now, Glenn, Steve, Corey, thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Cheers. Cheers. The Hughes Brothers on Bulldogs Unleashed. And we'll be back to do it all again with some other great old players next week. Bye for now.